evening, everybody. As the head of PhD program, Scene Design, I'd like to welcome you for the first uh, session in a series of discussions of scene design that we are going to have this academic year. And I'm really uh, happy and very uh, honored to uh, have our distinguished guest tonight with us, Kate Burnett. British scenographer and uh, costume designer, also curator of uh, many uh, exhibitions shown at the Prague Quadrennial, and that's basically going to be our main topic tonight. Also, a uh, professor at Nottingham Trent University uh, in the UK, and on a more personal note, uh, a friend of our small scene design team for, for many, many years, and I think it's been seven or eight years that uh, we've been trying to have Kate here, so we are really very happy to have her uh, here tonight. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Kate and her team on getting a special award at this year's <laughs> Frappa Daniel for the exhibition that we are going to uh, talk about. And uh, please welcome Kate Bennett. Thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely <laughs> introduction. Um, right in. Okay. Um, we're going to we're going to look at some work, and uh, we're going to try and also um, look at some websites because uh, a couple of websites, just because it's the easiest way of looking at the work. Um, and I hope I'm speaking loud enough. I'm about to get a cold, so it's kind of I know I'm going lower and quieter. Um, <coughs> Uh, and then uh, I've got some questions, really, because I think there are a lot of questions about PQ at the moment and about the whole idea of exhibiting. Um, so the first, the first image I've got here, does, has, have people seen an Inspector Calls? Do you know this production at all? Yes, some of us. Some of you. Okay. It, and it, it's there because um, it was a play written by uh, an early, earlier 20th century writer um, J.B. Priestley, who wrote um, a lot of plays and books that appeared to be set in kind of normality, middle class England, but were in fact asking a lot of very difficult questions of the status quo. And this set, uh, which was at the, at the National Theatre in London, um, the Olivier Theatre, um, no, the Littleton Theatre, was incredibly wide screen, a very wide stage, and the designer, Ian McNeil, asked for a backdrop that would carry on going past the ends of the stage and off <coughs> into the scene dock. And so it felt as if, it felt cinematic, it felt as if that world never ended. And in the middle of the stage, this great big kind of panorama, was this strange house. And as the play started, a little boy, there was radio noise, a little boy, there was a curtain, there was a curtain in front of it all, a little boy comes on, it's the war time, turns the radio, curtain goes up, red curtain of the traditional theatre goes up, this big landscape is revealed, house, and gradually you hear noise in the house, and you hear clattering and talking and a family inside this funny little wedge-shaped house. And then, I can't remember how, it's the staircase, does he put the staircase up, or somebody else puts a staircase up to the house, and the, the, the sides of the house fly open, and there's this strange wedge-shaped stage with a full dinner scene of a kind of um, pre-First World War family going on in there. There's a big domestic argument, there's lots of things going on, and at some point, uh, the crowds of the ordinary people who are not in their world come on, and the whole thing tips forward, and the entire dinner service, the entire furniture, everything tumbles out and the world is never the same again. And so this, it was the most extraordinary staging of a piece which is normally set in one room in a classic 19th, early 20th century box set with a dining table and an inspector comes to visit them and it all happens around the table. It had never really been thought of in this way that the world was actually needed to be shown in with the characters who destroy themselves in the world. Um, it had only ever been seen, as it were, in their world, not in the greater world. 
So it seemed to me as a, as a good place as any to start with, a, with an image of a, of a play that kind of talked about the destruction um, of, of the status quo. Of course it was put, in, put on, first of all, in our national theatre. And then it toured to proscenium theatres uh, around the country and around the world. So you could argue that it took its place in the traditional theatre like, uh, like all good productions should. Okay. So, can I move on? Am I going to do that one? Am I going to do that one? That one. Okay. Well, has anyone seen this particular, <laughs> this particular image, the K Foundation? Uh, the K Foundation are two particularly mad British artists um, who put this advert into the Guardian, um, and they they put posters up all over the place, and they. Uh, set up an almighty, well, joke, really, um, for, they advertised for the worst, uh, an, uh, an award for the worst artist, just at the point at which uh, Rachel Whiteread was going to be awarded uh, a major, the turn prize. And um, they were going to burn £40,000 outside the Tate Gallery, but she rushed out and claimed it. Um, when they named her the worst artist, she was about to get the best artist too. And um, the joke carried on, a lot of argument, a lot of people on either side of whether this was a joke or not a joke. And eventually they ended up burning a million pounds on the island of Jura, uh, Scotland. And depending on your point of view, that's either a very good joke or it's a very, very bad joke uh, and shouldn't be a joke at all. It seems to me that um, there are many things about the Prague quadrennial at the moment that are in the same area. And um, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm one to say uh, on which side I stand at the moment, but I'm certainly awaiting further instructions because a major rethink is in progress. Okay, so, um, okay. So then just a few things. I've been starting to read um, about curatorship myself, having just sort of done it, really. Um, I just thought, and I thought for a long time, I was a theatre designer who um, happened to stick their head above the parapet <coughs> and um, uh, aim to put on exhibitions from the point of view of being a theatre designer and being fascinated by and caring passionately about uh, designed for, for performance at all levels, uh, all levels, levels the wrong con uh, word, all contexts in, um, in the UK uh, and beyond. And um, so I've been starting to read about it and think about what actually being a curator is, because having done four or five exhibitions, I probably need to take myself a little bit more seriously um, as somebody who, who puts things together. Um, Abramovich's statement that was uh, held up as a celebration of Hans Obrist's um, re uh, inauguration, I can't remember which one it is, but anyway, this is a, an Abramovich statement. Um, again, very related to Prague. I think there is a, a great deal of curatorship going on at Prague at the moment, uh, and possibly um, an absence of many of the artists. Um, there are a great deal of events being made there um, because the event is important, but possibly without um, a lot of the artists maybe working in those regions or those countries being represented. Do they need to be? Maybe the event is everything. Um, so collecting a biological function not unrelated to our physical appetites. Kenneth Clark um, was a great British um, um, cultural sort of pundit, collector, advocate of the arts, employer of many artists during the war to make records, to, um, to give them a, a bit of a living, to stop them being called up, although some of them were, as artists uh, at the front. Um, in the bombed cities um, and so on, recording 
people's lives recording what was actually going on. So he played a huge part in the arts um, for quite a lot of the 20th century. So then other, other ideas of what um, somebody who's putting the arts or collecting the arts or staging the arts um, might be. A bricoleur is a very um, a sort of nice word that's being used a lot at the moment. And certainly, um, I think a bricoleur is, is quite close to sometimes how I feel putting on the exhibitions when we don't have enough money. We don't have... Um, we don't have... Uh, facilities or or anything to hand. <coughs> so that too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this was switched off, sorry. Okay. Um, so then a curator, if in if in doubt with my students, I must admit um, I nearly always say, go and look up the word. Go and look up the Latin of that word and see, uh, or the Greek, and see where it comes from and see what the original use of it was. Uh, and in this, in this case, it's incredibly close, obviously. Um, I was quite interested in the idea of the bureaucrats in charge of. That seemed to me to be very appropriate. Um, because in the old days of PQ, um, Obviously, the Prague Quadrennial was kind of was um, um, looked over, was was protected, was actually advanced by the government, little realizing what was going on behind their backs um, in the dialogue between artists from all over the world. Um, but also, very often, the uh, the regional hubs of Oystat, the actual representative bodies that put on. Um, their country's exhibitions at Prague are actually um, state bodies or their government uh, organisations that uh, have large grants to do that sort of thing. And that's the case for some countries, but not all countries. So again, bureaucrats seem quite useful. Um, caretakers, I like that. I like that very much. A caretaker, somebody who looks after a building or, or a, a or a, a, yeah, a school or a hospital or something, but also is a caretaker and a caretaker of other people's work. So I think that's a, that's a particularly nice version. And then we come to the medieval, the parish priest. Yes, do you still, we have, um, we have uh, curates uh, in the UK, in the Protestant church, and uh, obviously they're a servant of a higher power, a higher being. And so we come back to the bureaucrat, the, the curate, both, both serving some sort of higher being, uh, or maybe serving art in our case. So it's a little useful play. I'm just going to show you some images um, that actually come from um, the exhibition the UK did in 2007. It says 2006 because our exhibition was got together, the main exhibition was got together in 2006. Now the images I've got, I could show you some theatre images that were, were in that exhibition, but actually the images that we picked out as publicity images and to promote the exhibition were actually nearly all ones um, that weren't in theatres. So this company, Seven Sisters, Sophie Jump is one of, was one of our judges this time. She's one of the most interesting, um, consistently interesting um, theatre artists um, in, in the UK. She works with a small company called Seven Sisters, who are just a bunch of, of girls who um, uh, a director herself um, dances for particular projects. And they always work in found spaces. So this was um, John Lewis, is in Oxford Street, and they have done something quite clever here as a, as, a, as a published image. But in fact, the box with the dancer in was in the, the big window of the shop, and indeed the crowds gathered outside and watched her inside. And she was dressed in a sort of ethereal white dress, and she kind of writhed around the box and moved around the box and was in there for sort of hours. And they, and people were sort of, obviously fascinated by 
the trapped beauty in the box, yeah? But also they could see their reflections looking in. So it's a kind of a complex, clever, clever image performance. So it's a dancer, clearly. Um, this one, the water banquet. Um, this is a wonderful, it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful piece. Um, I've seen an awful lot of photographs of it. I've never attended it. It's very complex to set up. Um, Richard Downing uh, is an academic at, uh, or an artist who's based at Aberystwyth. This is um, a huge banquet table. I think it was nine meters long. And basically it's like a bit like a, a, a table with a, a dip in it, about six inches deep, maybe less, lined with black so that the water is kind of both very dense but also reflective. And they have, um, they, they have, um, they invite, I think it's 20, no, it can't be 27, 18 people to dinner. And they give them all a menu and people sit and they choose what they're going to have. And each item on the menu is, um, is uh, a piece of performance. So there's a dancer who comes onto the table and comes down and, and does a particular dance. There's someone who comes and plants forks, as you can see, all the way down the table. There are a number of different things. And the final course, of course, is um, the jets of, um, of gas that are underneath the water that finally flame. Yes, so someone sets fire to them. And so the entire table flames which is, as you can imagine, spectacular. Um, and so that's, uh, again, a kind of piece of performance of which we only have the image, yes? So all of these are, you'll see where I'm going in a minute, um, okay? This is um, Roma Patel doing, um, an, a designer who's been very interested in, um, in digital work, in mapping, um, in, um, actually I haven't got her process work with me, uh, but which shows, shows how she works. This is just a particular beautiful piece of uh, a tempest that she did in Ireland, uh, in a town park, in a park, where they created an artificial island over several months. They planted, they worked with the gardeners in the, in the park to plant, um, up the island and make more islands and then there are these um, these telescopic sort of poles uh, that Ariel was up that Prospero watched everything from at various points and this great big fountain which actually is a 19th century fountain in the park in the background um, the piece starts after dark obviously so that it becomes quite magical the reflections in the lake around them um, uh, are Fabulous, and as you can see, that there's a sort of distance. There's a distance um, between the actors and the audience. The whole thing has to become spectacle, um, and it plays with a sort of the re-reading of familiar environments, the part that you take for granted during the day, and what it can become uh, in that in that dark. This is another artist who works outdoors. I've shown a couple of her pieces. Um, already um, this week. Um, this is um, Louise Ann Wilson. She did the piece that was in Morecambe Bay with the, with the body in the water. Um, and um, this is another one, Mulg that happened, um, Mulgrave Woods, which was a private estate up near Whitby on the east coast of, of Yorkshire, so well out of London. And um, the owner of that estate um, going back several generations had been in India and when he came home he didn't really want to leave India he was one of the East India Company kind of uh, generation of English colonials and um, he came back and he brought his elephant and he bought a small brought possibly bought a small Indian boy with him who lived on the estate and the um, the promenade performance started at one end of the estate and it traveled up through the woods to a castle on the top of, in the middle of the estate that nobody ever saw if they weren't invited onto the estate. And it eventually came down and down, down to the sea, to the village on the other side. 
Um, and as they came down, they would see lots of events happening. They would see people running through the woods. They would, they would hear conversations. They would watch small snippets of action. And as they came down the other side, um, they saw the little boy who'd been running down through the woods, running out to sea under the bridge and over the top the elephant going across. Now you can see that the elephant is actually on a cart <laughs> um, being pulled over the bridge. Um, and what you forget looking at that picture is of course all the village on either side. Um, so you have here what you never saw in performance. Yeah? You have an image of something which has its own resonance and does summon up and evoke a, an amazing um, quality of the performance and truth of the performance, but it isn't actually all that the audience saw. So this is something that we can do in retrospect with an exhibition that we can't do at the time, and only 80 people at a time saw that show. So it was limited to time and place. It couldn't be reproduced all around the world in cross theatres or anything like that. Okay, so Stuttgart Ballet, um, one of a series of ballets. This did happen in a proscenium theatre. <coughs> the reason we, we put this one in is because um, it was a fabulous photograph <laughs> of um, a fabulous kind of moment. Um, just that extension, that fantastic kind of extension of the body of, of that character. Um, it exists in the moment of the action. Yeah? It will be gone a second later. And so unless you have a photograph of it, you've lost it. Yeah? And if you were there, fantastic. If you weren't, you've lost it. Does it matter? Probably not. But it's a great it's but it's a great image to have. And it's an image that I've carried with me. Um, ever since, because it's, it, I think it's particularly strong. Okay, this is a costume design. Um, Bex Andrews is a um, fantastic designer of, say, younger generation, she probably isn't anymore. Um, and she uh, now works, she studied for her PhD, which she's got, she now teaches at Leeds and a couple of other universities. And she was one of the designers who was very much um, taken up with using collage um, as a way of exploring ideas for a costume and a character, as a way of getting to a character, um, as much as drawing. And all the designers I know who use collage uh, this extensively um, say that it's not quicker by any means. It's actually quite a slow, painstaking process. So it's not about achieving speed. It's about that thing that we do, which is to go, not that one, not that one, not that one, oh, a bit of that, and a bit of this. And actually, through elimination, finding out what it is that you want to do. And I think collage is very much part of that process. And it's something that Bex does. Now again, this is part of her process. If we hadn't had the exhibition, we'd never see that drawing. This exhibition went on to the V&A. Oh, I think I've, I've just pulled this one out of proportion slightly. Um, and uh, this is an S. Devlin design for the Royal Shakespeare Company. The floor had lots of lights in it. Um, it was a mirrored surface. It was. Um, um, an Elizabethan play, and I've forgotten the name of it, which is terrible. Um, but it was our kind of our image for the VNA. Why was it the image for the VNA? Because the VNA wanted something that would be recognisable, that was recognisably theatre, but was a kind of art image. It had history in it, but it was clearly someone on a stage. So for them, it was the perfect image for an exhibition of theatre design. Ralph Koltai, uh, in 2006, happened to be doing uh, an exhibition. Ralph Koltai is kind of uh, our very, very famous um, um, designer uh, in England. He's actually not English, he's Polish, but he's been living in uh, the UK since the Second World War, uh, where he was sent as a little boy um, to be brought up. 
And um, in 2006, at, at, a, at a great age, he agreed to design. Um, am I speaking loud enough? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he agreed to design a new production of a very controversial play called Romans in Britain. The Romans in Britain had been staged at the National um, in the 1970s or 80s. I'm really sorry, I can't remember that. And um, it caused a huge uproar because it was a tale of the Roman soldiers, Romans being in Britain, obviously, and what soldiers get up to. And in this particular instance, the Roman soldiers got up to quite a lot of buggery. So, do you, do you know what I mean? Yes. So, um, it was banned, uh, or there were various um, moralists in, at the time who tried to get it banned and to um, uh, protest a great deal. So the play hadn't really been done uh, for a very long time because of this, because most theatre companies thought it was just a little bit too controversial. And, and uh, the buggery, as it were, is, uh, is both a political statement for what the Romans were doing to the British, but it's also a kind of, you know, um, it was also a scene that people didn't think was really necessary uh, in, in itself. Um, Sheffield Crucible Theatre decided that they would do it, that indeed um, that idea of um, uh, violence um, to other people from occupying forces and so on was necessary uh, to show. And they employed Ralph Coltai. They employed Ralph Coltai not only because he's uh, a fantastic sculptural playwright, uh, play, uh, designer, but because also uh, he was involved as a young translator um, in the um, Nuremberg uh, trials. And he was there when a great a number of Nazi um, um, criminals were being um, interrogated and prosecuted uh, and finally um, condemned. So um, he was part of that. And so um, I suppose they thought his political background would also be relevant. I can remember going to the theatre, sorry this is quite long-winded, but I'm hoping it's useful to you. Um, I will remember going to the theatre, this is my local theatre, we've talked about it, it's one of the very great thrust stages in the UK and it happens to be local to me. I remember walking in the door of the auditorium and seeing this extraordinary thing on the stage. And this was um, the set. Now it happened to be a fantastic tree root that Ralph had found in his garden in France. And um, this was his way as a sculptor of working with rusty metal, it's worth going on his website, working with rusty metal, with bits of wood, with bits of detritus, and putting them together to make sculptures. They were very often, um, they were very often symbolic of the human body, of the decay, and um, orifices and all sorts of other things and so when one saw this great big piece that looked actually the way it had been treated the sculptor who worked with him and made a lot of his very big sculptures had made it quite specifically to look like bone then the whole thing started to have a kind of resonance it was also placed so that underneath it was a pool of water and in order to get from the one side of this sculpture to this side, um, you had to plunge into this pool of water. So the, the entire sort of action, the soldiers, the British, the, you know, and so on, were, were, were stumbling in and out of the water into the sand on either side. There was an entrance quite clearly, it was saved up through the, uh, the entrance in the middle. And the whole thing was, um, placed this play into another world because of the sculptural quality of it and placed it on another level of symbolism and, and so on that went beyond the original. When I saw it, I thought, um, I think I'd really love this to be in the PQ. I don't know if Ralph will put his work in, but I'll ask him. So I saw him afterwards and said, Ralph, um, it would be fantastic if you would 
let us put this into the prior, into PQ, um, into the national exhibition. And, and I knew that actually I needed to say PQ, so I did. And um, he said, well, yes, 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 we should, yes, yes. So we agreed to meet in London and, um, and I said, um, would you think of doing a design for us that would, could be the exhibition? Because I knew he'd talked about doing exhibition design with Peter before, with my colleague before. Um, and so he, um, we met in London and um, let me get rid of Ralph for the time being. I want to get back to yes, thank you. And slideshow. Okay. From beginning, from current. From current slide, yeah. Okay, come on. Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Ralph turned up <laughs> with um, these maquettes. And they were pieces of wood, thick plank, uh, onto which were mounted these, um, these rusty bits of metal. And there was a tall square one, and there was an, two oblong ones, and then there was this curve, and this, uh, the cutout behind it. And there was a, a little block, a little um, sort of slice of solid, um, a metal sort of at the side of it and um, I looked at these three and he put them on this glass table in his sitting room and we we kind of sat there and looked at them very seriously and I kind of said well I think I think this one would be great and um, he said oh yes yes so I this is a maquette and I will I will make a bigger one so uh, I will make one probably about this big so I said that would be fantastic Ralph um, when I'm looking at it, I'm sort of looking at it as if it was at 1 to 25. Do you think we could make it life-size if, if you read this at 1 to 25? And he looked at me with absolute shock. <laughs> and, um, and I think kind of thought, oh my God, she's serious. And, um, and, and we went from there, really. So the next thing was to go and talk to the sculptor that he worked with, um, Stephen Pyle and to, um, to work out what size it was, quite, whether, it, and it was pretty well at 1 to 25 actually, the right size, and, um, and how it was going to be made. But he's standing about half to two thirds of the way up the circular piece at the back. Um, so it was quite big really. Um, we needed an entire metal structure. I've got lots of photographs that show all, the, all of the structure. We don't necessarily need to go into that. And then um, it was, it, they covered it with um, fiberglass. And the specialism of this particular sculptor was to um, use metal powder in the fiberglass. That, so he filled it so full of iron filings, basically, that the whole thing um, was able to rust as if it was metal. So as if it was iron. So uh, it was made in, in pieces. The big piece was in, in two. Uh, we had to have an entire platform made that was about nine inches, eight inches deep, so that the thing really could be a slice just standing into its platform. And it really was um, only, only approximately 50 centimeters, 40 to 50 centimeters, if that, in depth so at six plus meters but only that deep it needed a certain amount of structure underneath for it to be safe and to sit there so the idea was that we put something in our space and in the old Vishta Vishta um, sort of uh, expo uh, industrial palace that was a, a, an exhibition centre for everything that I think went to Prague. Um, the idea was that we would fill our space with our platform into which Ralph's sculpture was embedded and then we would, um, it would become as it were a set in, in itself. So the sculpture becomes a set, the audience, the viewers would they could come from the back of the exhibition, they weren't encouraged to, would actually come from the front of the side and they would walk through it 
and into the smaller artwork. Um, I was having problems really with the V&A about the whole idea of um, what was art and whether theatre design could be considered as art. Um, and what the place of theatre design was in the V&A. We went into the V&A because they closed the theatre museum and they decided that the theatre arts were part of art, craft and design and they would have their special galleries. Okay, so that's, we were, that's why we were going there. In Prague, I wanted to do two things. One was I wanted to, um, I wanted to put something real that was actually at full size a piece of art in its own right. However, it needed to be performative because this was an exhibition of, of design for performance. But we didn't have any actors and we didn't want any actors. We wanted the visitors to the exhibition, of course, to be the actors and the performers and to use the, the structure as they wanted. A lot of people just came and stared at it. <laughs> A lot of people wandered up to it and touched it and discovered they got rust on their hands. Um, a lot of people kind of went through and round and back and, and then went off to the artwork. And some people came in from the back of the artwork and then suddenly found themselves up against this extraordinary shape um, with all this kind of light streaming through it. The lovely thing about Vishta Vishta was that there are these great big windows and so um, the light came pouring in and through all the holes in the artwork and sort of made the rust almost um, fluorescent in its kind of deep orange and redness. Um, and so it, it had an extraordinary kind of life in there. Um, the work that I've shown you now was the work, a lot of, some of the work that was in that exhibition and we chose to display that as plainly as we possibly could in, in contrast. We wanted to say, these were the pieces, they happened in time, in their time, in their places, and we're showing you what we can of them because they have their resonance as images. But we're going to give you this piece as a piece in its own right. When we got to the VA, when we went back, this was this strange transition from the theatre museum to the V&A. Um, I thought it would be fantastic to have Ralph's piece in the courtyard at the V&A, which is this beautiful red brick, fabulous uh, space with a kind of pool they've now made in the middle of it. And kids run in and out of the pool during the summer. There's a family of ducks that decide to, to <laughs> well, there's ducks that decide to have a family there um, because it's safe in there, which is very pleasant. Um, and I thought Ralph's piece would look absolutely extraordinary set in this pool. It would be reflected. It was kind of uh, on the orange side of the red of the brick. It would clash wonderfully with the brick on a rainy day, and and it would be a sort of wonderful, um, rich combination on a sunny or a sunsetty sort of day. I thought it was the right scale. It would be perfect. So I spoke to the V&A about it and they, the theatre department said, fantastic, fantastic, we should do it. And uh, we need to ask the director of the V&A because he chooses what goes into the courtyard. And so they went to the director of the V&A and he looked at the photographs and everything and he said, no. So he went back and said, why not? So eventually he came out and he said, um, he wrote me a long letter and said, um, we have um, many of Mr. Coltai's pieces in our archive and Mr. Coltai is a very great theatre designer, but he's not an artist. And so this piece, which is not art, was not allowed to be in the pond in the V&A. So because we thought it was going to go into that courtyard and we ill-advisedly had a very enthusiastic chat with the V&A staff at an earlier stage when we could have maybe changed the scale of it. The scale of it now was too big 
to go into the galleries in the exhibition galleries that we had. I think the weight of it would have been too great actually for the floors. So with great regret, Ralph's sculpture vanished in pieces up to Delstar um, Turing, uh, fabrication and Turing workshops uh, north of London and um, sat in the grass for a long time or rather I should say the grass grew through it and there were plans, we tried to sell it to people, we tried to get it put in Yorkshire Sculpture Park, we tried to, um, we tried to get it placed all sorts of places, but we couldn't do it because <coughs> it was not made by an artist. And so the idea of putting up a theatre design piece was um, too much for many people. A lot of people also thought that it wasn't art, because it wasn't made of metal. It was because it was made of fiberglass, which is a theatre technique. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? Um, it wasn't made of pure metal. Had it been made of pure metal, maybe we could have considered it. I have one more last thing to say about it, <laughs> which is um, that Pamela Howard, who uh, was a student of um, Ralph's and has, um, made, has put together exhibitions of Ralph's work in Prague um, and the UK and is doing one for next year, um, who's a fantastic advocate of his work, was very interesting about this piece. She was quite ambivalent about it. And she finally, in a, in a conversation, said, it's not quite good enough. It's not quite good enough um, because, because it's not quite pure enough. It hasn't been, his eye hasn't spent as long on it as he would need to have done if, if, it, was, if it was a piece of art in its own right that was rather than, let's say, a theatre piece or a piece for an exhibition. Now, I don't know whether that's right or not, it's still a discussion that, that we have. Um, and I could say that there was a day when I went to see it being made and I looked at the curve and I can remember thinking, that bit's not quite right. But because Stephen was an artist and a sculptor in his own right, um, I didn't quite have the nerve to say, is that bit quite right? And I should have done, so that you have a very bad curator in front of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> we live and learn, but it cost, cost us a lot, cost me a lot emotionally. And Ralph never really quite forgave v &A for it uh, at, at that point. I think they've probably since bought his work, so maybe he has. Um, so that piece lives as a great folly. <clears throat> it did exactly what I wanted it to do in the sense that it provoked an awful lot of people to go, I could do an exhibition, I could do an exhibition, we could do an exhibition better. <laughs> and that was absolutely perfect because at that point that was going to be my last, certainly. And there was no one coming forward and I needed new people to come forward and go, I can do it better. Uh, and it did, it provoked the next bunch to do the next one. Um, so it did do its job in that way. Uh, I was very pleased and honoured to have the opportunity to work with Ralph um, and to actually realise a piece of his work um, and to see how he worked. Um, and I think as that was the last exhibition in Vista Vista and after that it moved into the contemporary um, the Czech Rep um, Republic's National Contemporary Art Gallery, isn't it? And then, and then this year out into lots and lots of different sites. It was kind of the end of an era, I think, at that point. And oddly, this piece was fitting within that context. Um, I don't know, I mean, we still had the British kind of work isolated in its sort of white or grey surrounds kind of being um, it, it sort of 
spare and um, clean presentations of, of other moments and other opportunities. We haven't moved past that, but we had tried to come into the moment, I suppose, or into the performative with artwork with this. Okay, uh, they've all vanished. Oh, they're all there. Um, I'm going to just whip forward just for any people who weren't here last night. Okay, so just very quickly, I'm just showing you um, th that this year's solution was completely different for people who weren't here yesterday when I was um, talking about it. This year, we took no models, no set, no images, but we worked with um, um, a group of students who are studying projection mapping in an 18th century palace to re-clothe, repaint the walls, if you like, with um, projected versions from stills and video of the shows that had been chosen to go to Prague. And each show took um, about 50 seconds and um, reworked and played and disappeared and came and went on the walls uh, with the audience sitting or standing in the middle. Uh, the technology was such that you could get very close to the walls um, and, thank you, and, um, and actually still see the images. So they managed to map out the chandelier and the stove and there we are. So that's just a few images that bring you up to date. Okay. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to ask you a few questions, really. Or I'm going to say the questions that I've got in my mind. What, obviously, is PQ for now? What will PQ be for in 2019, as opposed to 2015? Can you mix 70 different cultures and ethnicities in one event? Can you mix um, such different themes? Do we need themes in order to present our work in an international context? This year they were music, politics and weather, which obviously suggests that they're hoping some of the work is going to be outdoors or, or you're going to bring the outdoors in. Um, and as you can imagine, this year the politics was very important to the whole thing. Um, for the UK it was very simple. We had opera, we had opera happening outside, and we had opera happening outside in very bad weather, um, with, um, with a lot of politics of production and the kind of opera that was going on. We had a lot of shows. It worked. Um, sites and venues one or many diversity of venues we went from modern galleries to 18th century palaces to undercrofts to street how to arrange the work already national has had to become national and regional does it actually have to increase in diversity of of denomination as it were do you need those identities uh, to be marked. Should actually individual countries, regions, organisations be the people who select what is to be there? It's a retrospective of work in the last four years. That's obvious because it happens every four years. Should it stay that? Is that important? Would it be nice to see bodies of work of an individual artist that maybe is 20 years worth of work? Comparison and, con uh, and competition, uh, is that really the way to look at art? To put it in, into comparison and put it into competition? So back to Rachel White Reed um, at the beginning. Uh, is it right that an artist should be up for prizes of 40,000 or greater? Is that a good use of money? Is that how we wish to spend our money in the arts? Should it actually be supporting smaller work that couldn't otherwise be made? because those top artists are getting their work bought anyway, so 40,000 probably isn't very much to them. Um, event versus exhibition. 
Is it important that there is an exhibition? Is it actually the event of all those artists being there, of actually making something in the moment that is important? I've kind of done a little arrow here down to a later comment which goes, everybody was running around having experiences. Is that actually um, a good use of time? Do we need some time for reflection? for sort of standing still in front of something that isn't moving and actually just having the opportunity to think about it. Even better to walk away from it, come back and it's still the same thing and you can think about it again. Yes, that's actually a very important function of art galleries. <coughs> Time-based work relates to that. So much of the work nowadays um, in, any, in any context, but in art context, is time-based. It means that you have to give it time, and actually getting a viewer, a visitor, or an audience to give time to something is one of the hardest things as a curator to do, because um, people expect to just grab it with their eyes and move on. Even better, grab it with that and move on. Yes, and so the idea of actually spending time is very difficult for people. They go, well, how long? How long have I got to give it? And where did I come in? Was there a lot before I came in? Is it going to be very much later? You know, what do I do? So we're very careful. We put timings up if we have any time-based material. We put a time timing up so people can actually see how long it lasts and how long they've got. So they can decide. If you do that, it's really remarkable. They will stay for much longer. And they'll watch it something else or they'll watch it again because they feel secure in the time that they've got to give it. Um, so I think short of actually sitting here and flicking through all the Prague Quadrennial um, exhibits, and there are 70 of them, um, then actually I think I'm probably done for now because it would be nice to leave time for a few questions uh, and, and so on. So thank you ever so much for listening to that. Okay, do, do we have any immediate reactions or, or questions before we start any particular discussions or comments on the last bit of, of the lecture? I have one which has nothing to do with <laughs> both the, both the questions after, but I'm very curious. That uh, theater play about Romans in mm -hmm. uh, is it also like when you watch it about British colonialism and what British mm -hmm. did in no, the colonies? But, um, the writer, oh my god, I'm going to forget who it's by. Um, the writer um, is um, a fantastic, um, he, he's a playwright who always writes symbolic, coded um, plays. So um, he'll write, uh, it's not Anna Wesco, is it? Um, he'll, I'm so sorry, I can't remember his name, my old brain is disintegrating. Um, so he, he quite deliberately writes about a period, or he was writing about a period in our history, but he was making um, an equation with how we were behaving as he perceived it in Ireland and how we had behaved elsewhere. So um, we weren't buggering people in Ireland, I don't think. Well, that is my question. <laughs> what, was it able to, to connect uh, with the present? present time or 60s or you know in, in, in Britain? I'm afraid one of the British favourite expressions is oh bugger <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and uh, when you say something is buggered up or they were buggered I'm afraid it's a common UK uh, expression in not in polite circles obviously but uh, everybody would understand the reference um, to violating to I'm not saying that that was an, a national pastime in all our colonial <laughs> um, situations, no. It was a metaphor. <laughs> but it's a, it's a great play, if you, it was a good play. Mm -hmm. Do you have any answer 
Clear opinion. Mm -hmm. For example, do we need topic? Do we need topic? Yes. Um, there have been topics. What I didn't say was there have been topics for years, haven't there? Because there were, they would have like Shakespeare productions as the theme. Yes. Um, not the or, theme. Not, no, just the not national and countries. Local. Yeah. Do, national. do we need? Do we need some title, or some topic, or some problem to put us together in some, in some, I don't know, space of? Or not? Is it possible? Is it, is it um, necessary? Is, well, it, is it worthwhile or not? Um, I suppose the answer is that some countries take note of it and others don't. And so for some countries they, they use it as something to hang things on or they try to fulfill what PQ asks or um, it's a challenge. Um, for other countries, I think they completely ignore it and put in the work that they want to put in anyway. Um, for us, I thought about it for about five minutes. No, I didn't. For a bit longer. And um, I realised that the work that we had was going to cover it and that actually um, I wasn't going to put that as a... Um, no, I, I couldn't put that onto our selection because of our responsibility. What I haven't talked about is in a sense for the for the UK at the moment, and things may change, the responsibility of the Society of British Theatre Designers to its members. And because they pay to exhibit in the UK and be in the catalogue, we have a kind of responsibility towards them to give them the opportunity to um, be selected for PQ and unless we set up right at the beginning which was before the PQ themes were announced sort of a year or two half 18 months before we wouldn't be being fair to the members just to, to do that I knew that the work that would be selected um, because you know because I'm an old hand and somewhat cynical um, I knew that a lot of the work that would be selected would fit those themes anyway. So everything I... Everything, exactly. Yes, precisely. So they were fabulous. So in other words, they were great themes because they could be provocative to some people and, um, and, um, uh, and, and ignored by others if wanted. Um, Everything that won prizes probably dealt with political, apart from maybe the Finnish sound. Yeah, but it, but yeah, but even that was probably political in its choice of yes. Yeah. Finnish was also, you know, two sides. Yes. Depends on how you look at yes. from which position. So it Precisely. Be political as well. Yes. So, I would say that everything, I would say politics dominated, obviously, obviously, yeah. yeah. Um, do I think there needs to be a theme? Um, it, for such a huge event, it can be quite useful, I think. It gives people, it gives people a starting point, even if they disagree with it. Um, and I think it was interesting that it came away from Theatre, as a you know, from either a writer or a, a sort of oeuvre or something. So, yeah, I think it probably is useful, and it means it also meant that your curators it gave them it shared the responsibility because there's the overall directors of Prague, but they involved some curators, three curators, and each had weather, music, politics. Now, as it went on, I've no idea how that actually operated. Um, but it, it sort of probably helped to share the, share the load. Uh, I wanted to say, I asked uh, Soja about the, the, the teams and the number of <laughs> those who were uh, oriented to, towards some topics. She said the majority was politics yeah. and a uh, few, and some were weather and very, very few were music. Who, who said this? Soji. Soji did? Yeah. Oh really? That's interesting. Yeah. 
Although, yes, it's true, the majority were politics. Yeah. But, um, but yes, lots of things have music in them, lots of things have, some things have weather in them, so in space. Yeah. What do you think about space? About it's better to be a common spot or, or space. Or to have more spaces, or is, is it better to have some environmental space or just gallery space? Or I think it's, I mean, the thing is that now Prague PQ's gone in a, sorry, PQ's, sorry, I'm turning that way, um, PQ's gone in a sort of, in a, in a very particular direction now since Vista Vista, and particularly in the last four years. So it would be very hard to go backwards, as it, to go back, rather. Um, it's also hard to go forward. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I think there are more countries taking part than there were um, when we were in one space. Um, I think the variety of uh, ways of exhibiting uh, has changed and I think putting it into different spaces actually is a better experience of Prague um, itself as a tourist idea. Um, so in, in many ways I think it's better that it's split up. I've met as many people who liked it being in different venues as didn't like it. And I think that the contemporary, if, I, if, we hadn't, if it hadn't gone to the ga contemporary galleries, I would probably say one space. But having gone there and it was a mess, I'm not so sure that a, just a great big contemporary gallery is, is right for it. Um, I think it would need to be really carefully curated to go back into that. And the trouble with Prague is, although they ask for so much information in advance, you know, it's a little bit like our national exhibitions. You never quite know until people turn up what they're going to bring. <laughs> um, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't see how it could do. I mean, for the first two, three exhibitions, two exhibitions, I didn't ever discover the middle of Prague. I just used to stay out on Vist Vista's sort of grounds and the funny li and the sort of hotels in all those grey buildings around. And I never went into the centre of Prague. And people would say, oh, you've been to Prague, how marvellous, it's so beautiful. <laughs> really? <laughs> I was I'm mortified, you know, but I was just, that's the way it was. <laughs> so I think it's great that we wandered around Prague for 10 days. Yeah, I, for example, very much like that concept of different or various spaces, yeah. and especially the possibility to choose a space. Yeah. Because I know you didn't choose your own space, but I think you did a marvelous job with actually turning it around and doing something else. And we okay. liked, I liked uh, Kafka yeah. very much. But then I had a problem with uh, everything happening in the center of Prague and not being able to understand whether something is part of the Pravenio or a regular life of Prague. Yes. Because on all the squares you have spectacle as well. So you can't really know what's what. No. And that, that was my, my main problem. That yeah. decision to have everything uh, in the Prague, in the center of the Prague, although I liked yeah. that yeah. idea very much. But that yeah. could be the part of the concept in the sense that uh, that is contemporary art and theatre. Everything is, you know, mixed with the real life. There was that, but actually people spent an enormous amount of time just scurrying around, you know, and running from kind of, oh, I've got to go and see this, oh, it's just starting, I better go, and just running. Whereas actually when it was at, 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 out at Vishta Vishta, you, you'd kind of go and sit, and everyone kind of knew where all the kind of different cafes and, you know, where you'd find people, and you just sort of were in, and if you wanted to get out of it, then you could really get out of it. Um, but again, okay, who is the PQ? Who, uh, who is the PQ is. for? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, they, yeah. Is it for, for people in Prague? Is it for us? Is it for uh, different kinds of people? So on? Because I, I felt PQ now for the first time visible yeah. in Prague. It yeah. was never us no. before. No. Well, I think, I suppose it's, it's the same as us stopping doing like the Riverside, the theatre, 
foyer kind of shows, you know, of going, we're going to go into a public art gallery and have the public sort of have this as, a, as an exhibition that they can go to and it be very visible and that's very important to us. Um, and I did think that it was great because I've met students coming for interview whose family, and we were saying to them, go to Prague, go to Prague, go to Prague, all for the six months beforehand. And, and there were lots of public, there were lots of families, there were lots of teenagers, there were lots of people just wandering around and they maybe only went to one or two venues, but they did actually see stuff that they wouldn't have done. So that was really good, I think. It would be nice for me to see the, all those pictures with those IDs yes. around the neck, yeah. going around Prague, and, and felt them as, a, as a companions. Yes, yeah. It was for the first, first, first time also. Yes it, yes, it was. So I suppose coming out of um, Vishta in particular was because it's an in industry expo site mm -hmm. meant that yes we for once we came away from being uh, just an industry event into ourselves um, and coming out of the gallery the big national gallery meant that we were no longer just serious art goers you know we were wandering around the streets being tourists being the same as everybody else there I, I come from. I don't come from theater. I'm. I'm a, a sculptor. Ezra Volpe. Ezra Volpe. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And uh, um, my. I was always comparing because this time I was in, in at Prague for Quadriennal for the first time, and I was comparing it to Venice, you know, and I found it was. All, very, uh, all, all nearby in Prague <laughs> because in Venice it's all around Venice. I never ever saw everything and it's impossible not to get lost in Venice and Prague is more, more uh, central European <laughs> in yeah. a way. It's uh, uh, in, in architecture and uh, so for me it was everything was nearby sort of and also it's cheaper so you can stay longer and uh, I th for me it was, it was very good feeling to, to have all those places all around Prague and one of the best uh, experiences for me was that uh, house uh, uh, with the... Um, what golem? Yes, golem. Oh yes, yes. 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 It, it is, I mean, I got lost when I went there. I went on the wrong bridge and experienced Prague. I didn't want to experience like where um, where uh, homeless people live, live and uh, leave their things around. And then I went back, and it was like experience for itself to get there. And then it was really great experience. And then I went to so me. It was. I, I cannot imagine. Being on one place, <laughs> I think it's problem that it's that you're comparing with Venice because the, then you don't have really good contemporary art and you don't have really yeah. good theater because what? that is the for me the main question actually yeah. how well, to what I liked in what Prague, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I liked in Prague the most was the were the things that wasn't like uh, Venice, you know, mm -hmm. that were more uh, actually events and things that are not, uh, that, that are ephemeral and uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, more more like performances, uh, like, uh, is it Lithuania? Miss Julie Latin and I'm bad in geography <laughs> and uh, also I, I like uh, I have to say the, the, the Serbian student <laughs> selection and uh, those were also um, Liechtenstein right? uh, like things that that are different than than Venice and that you can experience almost like theater or performance. But uh, uh, they are not performance, but you have the same feeling like like uh, like experiencing performance in a sense. So for me, that was the most interesting.
part of the vehicle. The main, que main question is how to exhibit theatre. Yeah. Now we have that question in front of us because we know now how to exhibit or how to perform, how to make events, how to make exhibition, yeah. how to be performed and so on. And we pass through that way. I think we, we need to go back. I feel that we need to go back to ask ourselves how to how to present theatre in gallery or in, 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 in different space than theatre belongs to. Belongs to. And yeah. is it possible? Is it, is it, is it, uh, do we need to do that? Well, is it yeah. more important? Uh, that, that from my position now, that is the big question. To all of us, of course, to myself, first of all. Mm. And to you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, I mean, I, I think you said the other day um, that um, there are people, there are plenty of designers who think, uh, UK designers, who feel that you know their work is ephemeral and that it serves a performance or it's about a performance and that when that performance is over the event has been and gone and that's it and they're very often designers who work a lot <laughs> so they don't ever have longers, they're always, they're always working so they do move from one to another and they tick them off. Um, and and for them, I think they're not interested in the reflective space of looking back at something. Um, I think it's quite a valid point that theatre exists in the moment of its performance and it's different every night, every day. So you, there's a perfectly reasonable argument to say why, why have an exhibition of it? On the other hand, so then you come to the point that Rush is saying is, is, is actually, um, why have an exhibition of theatre then? Don't have an exhibition of theatre. Just have an exhibition of contemporary art which might be performative. You know, lots of people want to come here and do something. Come and do it. So don't, don't do theatre. You know, if it, you're right in your question. Um, about um, is this you know is this not <laughs> bad bad art or um, it's not good theatre it's not good art what is it because it's not being conceived of by fine arts or visual artists giving it the rigour for something in its own right and that's where we come back to collaboration it's the product of collaborators and therefore it's inevitably a compromise. Every single production I've ever worked on, to some degree, has been a compromise. You can make the photographs look in the moment as if it's not, or it's something else. Um, but the actuality of it's been a compromise. So, um, so maybe it's not worth showing, maybe you just have to let it have its time and, and come and make something which is conceived of in its own right for this point now, here at Prague, that maybe has something to say about theatre. But the trouble with theatre is theatre is always about something. So theatre in its very essence is not a pure form. It never has been. Because... Uh, <laughs> Because you bring too many things to it, you know. You bring, you bring your, you know, your eyes and your ears and your your physical being and your. You bring everything to it, so you're already receiving information on so many levels that there's very, very few moments in very, very few pieces that are such a perfect synthesis. Um, I can, you know, in my, I can think of very few that work on that level, and when they are, they're extraordinary but then how the hell do you convey them to anybody else? Because they sort of exist in your head, in that perfection. So I, I, do, I, don't, I genuinely don't know. Um, I, I'd like, I personally, and you can tell from what I showed, think it's really valuable to have the opportunity to reflect on something that may only be a, a, a tiny bit of something that happened. 
because it is that combination. But that's also connected because you're coming from a country that has enormous production, that yeah. has also the uh, unity of uh, <coughs> unions uh, and things, you know, so associations, and you have a structure yeah, for that. Have a structure. And but it's a structure that's made up of individuals. You know, yeah, that, that, that um, anyhow. Um, I mean, yeah. A lot of people. That was what I was, I was thinking, you know. Uh, yesterday you talked about the selection process. Yeah. And you just said that you uh, sort of promised uh, the artists that, you know, they would exhibit their work in Prague, but they yeah, are not on a certain that. topic. Yeah. But the thing oh, is that you have. I don't know how many productions a year, uh, how many theaters, how many yeah. productions, uh, yeah. on which level, uh, what variety of productions, because for example for me it was very interesting to see, you know, those like small local mm. productions outside actually theater buildings. Absolutely. And then you have community theater and then, yeah. uh, I'm not complaining about a situation, that's not my point, mm. but the thing is, when we think about uh, our national production, yeah. There's basically nothing really to talk about, and so it's it's a very difficult, you know, position. And yeah, it but is, I, yeah, when you have to select from thousands of excellent works, then it's a different approach. I, I don't say it's, it's um, yeah. easy, yeah. but then when you have almost nothing and you want to provoke some things, mm. then it's a different position. So mm. it's and times seventy, as you said. Sorry, yeah. 70 countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, 60, 70, yeah. different, really different positions. Yeah, yeah, very. I mean, uh, I know we're in we're in a very particular situation. Um, but for instance, looking at Sanchez's work a uh, website yesterday, you know, she managed to get some beautiful photographs of you know something happening in a tiny, mad space. Uh, that kind of, you know. Yes, okay. but if you if you if you look from that position of association or society, which yeah. we have also here. Uh, in UK, you have that that situation can you explain? And in Serbia, for example, when they in two thousand, let's say five, decided to take that position national period for two thousand seven. Yeah. I really asked myself what to show. Mm. Because our production at the end of the 90s and the beginning of 2000 was really awful. And it was divided in two different, from my point of view, two different uh, streams. Yeah. One was the really low tech production uh, based on some ideas. And in spite of the fact that it was very important for us to have that, that, that sort of theater during the 90s, struggling against, against some political or social mainstream and so on. It was not, uh, it was not easy to, to show any of, of that production visually, because it, it was not based on, on anything visual. It was based mainly on narratives, on, on, on communication, on social action and so on. And the other, other stream was based on our famous artists. And they, a lot of them, or some of them, made their own line of expression through theater design, which was, from my point of view, but not connected at all with theater. It was something meant for gallery, meant for being photographed or photo, whatever. You know? So when I needed to decide what to do, I decided to, to start from, from the beginning and to ask an artist to do something new. Because I couldn't find anything in our production, yeah. which was at the same time worked by content and worked by home. And that, I think, think that situation in, in Serbia is not very much changed in the past 10 years. So basically, still we have productions or without an idea or need for saying something or without an aesthetics. So it, it, is, it is really not easy to, to uh, find an answer in that, in that way. And also, if you choose the other way, to show the 
current production, then we will have like five or six names every time. What? Same names. What? Because this as is... We had, as we yeah. had during the yeah. 80s and 90s. And same five names. Same five names, <laughs> still. yes, still, each, each production. But all, all of you are... <laughs> Yes, yes, but that's that's one yes, of the ways. I, I think it's very important to, to understand. I think that we all understand that there are several lines, yeah. and we don't have to choose one no. path. There are various yeah, yeah. various paths, yeah. and I think that I mean Prague Quadrennial was established because people working within theater who are not treated as artists. Yes or seen as artists, yeah. wanted to show their work yeah. because they wanted to be evaluated. And also, that was a meeting point for people all over the world. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a path which is valuable and should stay. But then there are other parts because the world changed. Yeah. And there are other parts. Some people, I want to have that experience. And that probably would be my, my path. And I don't know, other people who are nowadays working in designing exhibitions, for example. Yeah. But not to make business out of exhibition because it looks nice, but because through using um, scenographic way of thinking, you have, for example, younger audience coming to the exhibition. So yeah. that's probably the third part. Yeah. So there, there are different, I think, points of view which could contribute to, to the quadrennial. Mm -hmm. But it also, I don't know, it depends you know, who is going to develop it further and, and in which direction. Yes, it does. What um, would be the new ideology, if there yeah. is going to be any? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say that there's, there's a lot of work made in the UK that will never ever get seen in the Prague Quadrennial um, and that isn't very exciting visually. There's a huge amount um, of other work that's the kind of tip of the iceberg, and that's we know that that's special. Um, and there was certainly work shown in Nottingham that wasn't good art, good theatre, good what anything. It was just what people were doing. Um, but I do think that I learned a lot from a lot of uh, a lot of mostly younger designers who younger artists who found a way of making work that I knew in performance wasn't actually very extraordinary. Um, but they found a way of photographing it or representing it or putting it in some nice little box and doing something clever with it um, that, that told me of an idea that had, you know, that, that had my mind working and certainly there were pieces that did get selected for Prague and the V&A that I wouldn't have chosen but that um, convinced the people who were choosing them of, a, of an idea that needed to, you know, that could be shown again. So I, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't say that next Prague you will be the same, that there would I would say that there will be work. Of course there will be work. And it's how people th think about presenting it. Think about the idea continuing or presenting it. Wherever they are. I, I, but it may be that since you didn't do that this time, that actually that wasn't the most important thing for you. Do you, do you see what I mean? One, do, one does tend to do eventually, <laughs> the thing that's important to you. And it may be that you, that that actually wasn't important because you thought where the important things were wasn't there. And I, and I think that would be completely right and completely, you know, a good way, a, a good and interesting way to go. But on the other, sorry, just one last question. You mentioned the photography and that perfect moment of, of, of uh, freezing the time yeah. <laughs> in photography. I found myself having a huge problem with, with photographs that are 
So you need to put them on a table then. You need to get them and put them on the table. Because that, um, to have a look, because, you know, sometimes, you're right, a photograph is a photograph is a photograph. It's not the reality. It's not, it's not what it was. It's, it exists in its own right. We, we know that, don't we? So, so um, you, the, the thing that is always, that is kind of, fundamentally, and I'll be really uh, categoric about this, the thing that is fundamentally wrong is when you try to represent something that, that you can't represent, because you cannot represent a time-based uh, experience. You can give a moment, you can give a flavor, or a, you can catch a, a quality but you must recognize, like the forks in the water, you know, that that is just an image that appeals to the brain, that appeals to one in, on a number of levels. And yes, that moment existed, that bit existed in that performance. But as you say, it was surrounded by scraping of chairs and, and you know, the lights being on, whatever, whatever it was surrounded by. And, and, but if I'd had all that messiness, I might have got something of that performance, but I might not have that idea or that aesthetic something that that image conjured. Does that make any sense? Yes, but I don't agree. <laughs> okay, well, that's fine. I think if we had a table full of photographs, we could actually we could we could look at them. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Any questions from that side? What's the purpose of it? Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not asking you because. God! <laughs> <laughs> Speak for the whole British theatre. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, when we're speaking about national theatre and scenes in Serbia, I was working in Serbia National Theatre for many years. And uh, I was living in Italy. And I think that is the problem with the state very classical and like um, there is uh, not a connection with the reality of what is necessary, um, what the people mean, uh, what the audience would mean and what should represent the theatre, why it's not a commercial theatre. And I think I saw that in, it in Italy, for example, in, like in a not official scene, quite more underground theatre, yeah. uh, it's much more research work. Um, okay. Um, what is the purpose of theatre? I think that um, if you spent a couple of weeks in London and went to see everything the National Theatre did, you would think that some of it was for um, tradition, rich patrons who uh, are prepared to pay a great deal of money for their ticket, who may uh, endow the National Theatre, who may. Um, who would go to everything in the West End, who, and so on. And um, they play a very, very valuable part in contributing to the fact that theatre exists financially in the country. Um, there would also be a whole load of productions and events that those people, by buying their tickets, are paying for. And so um, they're, you know, they're subsidising. So, Without those, those things probably wouldn't happen. Now, I could criticise the National Theatre and say, well, you should be doing them. And they would turn around and say, if we just did those, we'd have an empty theatre, then the Arts Council would be, would be on our backs going, why isn't your theatre full? And then we'd lose our money. So we're kind of caught, and in the UK, we really are caught 
in a kind of terrible circle of, of justification and market, market forces and, um, and a degree of cynicism. Um, I can't forget, I was working for a little tiny fringe company and we were doing a particularly savage musical about wife beating. And uh, we took it on tour, <laughs> how we took it on tour, I have no idea. We took it on tour to Harlow Playhouse, which did um, uh, Yes, We Have No Pyjamas and other kind of, um, oh, I'm feeling so hot, I think I'm just going to take some clothes off, kind of plays. And, um, and they were happening in the main house and we did our musical about wife beating in the studio. And... Um, had they not been doing those plays in the main house, they couldn't have afforded to have the studio open for us to go and do the plays about wife beating. So there's a kind of very ugly and, un and peculiar d circle that goes on in the UK. And every now and then, something from the other side breaks through and becomes massively successful um, and, and plays so that all, all the people who in their posh clothes can actually see it as well. Um, but then, of course, that company gets taken up and then they get reviewed and then they get famous and then they go and be in the national... In the, in the, yeah. So, and it's very hard to stay clear of it. So there's that tension is going on all the time. Um, and I've, been, I've now been around so long that I kind of have seen a number of companies go through that cycle. And it's very, it's it's a very odd, odd and distressing process. So I don't know how to answer you, other than theatre exists because people need to tell stories. Fundamentally, whether it's in your house or it's somebody else's house or. Yes. <laughs> something completely. Yes. Uh, because we talk a lot about that. Uh, you are representing when you are making an exhibition. Who am I personally yes, you representing? Because we discussed a lot of, of yeah. that. Absolutely right to ask. Um, <coughs> I am <coughs> technically <coughs> representing the Society of British Theatre Designers. Not technically. Okay. Um, In 1992, I was a member of the Society of British Theatre Designers. I was also an artist, a theatre designer, I didn't even call myself an artist, theatre designer, who was fed up with the context in which I was making theatre, who was starting to work in other contexts, who wanted to... Um, make the theatre, make the stuff I was doing and other people like me and other people working in small scale visible and I was driven enough to, ha to take the opportunity that arose. It suited me in my life because I had a baby and I could work from home and I could in my back room sit at a computer or I could work with images and so it suited me to do that it was a time in my life when it made more sense than running around the country being a d freelance designer so that's a very honest answer for you um, in 2003 having got and then us having done it and having had success at raising money and putting the thing on three times, nobody else wanted to do it. So we kept doing it. I was back in theatre by then. Um, and in 2003, getting sick of working in my back room and having no money, I realised when we got the trigger that the position I was covering at Nottingham Trent University as a sabbatical for somebody could get extended into a permanent job. And if I did that, because of what I'd done, and if I did that, I could then use Nottingham Trent University <laughs> to organise <laughs> exhibitions, raise money, 
uh, and so on from that position and I could get paid for doing it. There you are, that's my honest answer. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's recording it. Nottingham Trent University is very well aware of my agenda. <laughs> I may not be there next year. <laughs> no, it's uh, it, it's uh, higher education. It's gone through a really interesting phase in the UK. Uh, there's a lot of designers uh, in in the 1990s. There was almost nobody who was professional theatre um, doing research. They were designers holding down teaching positions, heads of courses, but they weren't doing research. And as I think I said to you, we had this extraordinary experience in 1995, going to the Prague Quadrennial as a bunch of theatre designers, staying in a hostel that we were in, uh, education accommodation university accommodation, and on the other table having breakfast was a group of earnest academics. And we realised after a couple of days, sorry, you know this story, um, that um, they were discussing us. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they were coming to the exhibition at the, at the Vista Vista and looking at the work and discussing scenography. And that was a most peculiar <laughs> kind of idea because they're really we weren't an academic subject, we didn't think. And so it's really relatively recent that that has kind of happened. So now for it to go from a position of national, of heads of the national theatres, design departments or production managers, being able to get a little bit of money to go to Prague or go to Oystadt events, all of those positions have gone, all of that funding has gone, all of that spare money has gone, and that idea that the theatre company should be a part of an international theatre scene has gone. And the only people who could get funding to travel anywhere are academics. Hence the academicisation, to some extent, of PQ and the academics acting as curators in some cases, and I now have to count myself as one of those as well. So it's a very, that is something that has happened to PQ. And I don't know whether if Sodja stops, whether she will or what, that's what we're debating really, isn't it? It's kind of what happens then. She said that she will stop. Really? After this uh, symposium. After this symposium. She actually left, but the symposium is the last thing she's doing. Really? Okay. Yeah. She wants to be a teacher. Does she really? Okay. So, yeah, Prague's gone through an extraordinary change in whether, you know, and but now, of course, the universities are actually cutting back on the money for travel as well. So maybe Prague is going to be a virtual exhibition. <laughs> Next time we're all going to log in. <laughs> discussions yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, okay, so sorry. Think, uh, any, <laughs> any more questions? questions? Sorry. If not, okay, thank you very much it's for, for tonight. For uh, students of scene design, see you tomorrow at uh, the balance. Sharp. 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 <laughs> <laughs> of course, we'll work with Yeah, thank okay. you. All right. Thank you.